Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the second part of our two-part series about people who killed for inheritance money. If you haven't seen part one, be sure to check that out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of two people who murdered for their inheritance. At approximately 9 a.m. on October 13, 2014, Rose Marie Chavez arrived for work at the home of 50-year-old John and 48-year-old Joy Ruby. Chavez had been the family's housekeeper for 20 years, caring for the Ruby's property in Duncan, Oklahoma, where John and Joy had raised their two children, 19-year-old Alan and 17-year-old Catherine. Though the Monday morning had started off normally, all of that was about to change when Chavez entered the family's kitchen. There, she found the lifeless bodies of John, Joy, and Catherine. All of them had been shot to death. Chavez frantically called 911, telling dispatchers that the bodies of the three Ruby family members were ice cold and that none of them were breathing. She then called her daughter, who was given the heart-wrenching task of having to contact Alan Ruby, who was away at university, to tell him to come home right away because something was terribly wrong. Alan had started his freshman year at the University of Oklahoma in Norman a couple of months earlier. The campus was located about 70 miles away from the family home. When Alan drove down from school, he was greeted by police officers, who told him they needed to talk to him at the police station. Once there, he was informed about the deaths of his three family members. Upon learning the news, the 19-year-old nearly collapsed. He began to hyperventilate and started wailing and crying and could not be calmed down for some time. News of the tragic triple murder instantly spread throughout the state, but was an especially large blow to residents of Duncan. The Rubies were an extremely well-liked family, and the fact that anyone would have harmed them in such a brutal way was unthinkable. Prior to the shocking crime, the family seemed to be living an idyllic life that most could only dream of. Their 4,300-square-foot home was located in one of the wealthier parts of the small city, on a picturesque and peaceful tree-lined street tucked away from any nearby traffic. John Ruby was the third-generation owner of a newspaper dynasty and had run the Duncan Banner until it was sold in 1997. He had gotten back into the industry ten years later, purchasing the Marlowe Review in 2007, followed by the Comanche Chronicle in 2013. John and Joy had run the newspapers with a small but dedicated staff, writing many of the articles themselves. John would attend all sorts of high school sporting events, taking pictures for the accompanying articles the paper would run, while Joy would sometimes step in to cover local crime stories and other happenings in the local courts. Their work meant that they were deeply involved in the local and surrounding communities, something that was greatly important to them. Joy, in particular, was known for her dedication to community activities. She liked to help out at church and to raise money for local charities, and was the kind of person who could always be counted on to show up with a casserole or two in times of need. Though just 17 years old, Catherine Ruby had also made a positive impact on almost everyone around her. At school, friends and teachers knew her as an exceptional student and athlete, who was a beloved member of the Duncan High School volleyball team. She had a playful side to her and was something of a prankster who could always be counted on to lift the spirits of her teammates. Following her death, her jersey number was retired at the school in her honor. Unlike his parents and sister, who were known for their personalities and involvement in the local community, Alan Ruby was much more concerned with his family's wealth and the lifestyle that came along with it. Online, the self-described shopaholic often posted pictures of expensive things that he had bought or wanted, along with trips that he had taken to Europe and luxury hotels where he had stayed. In one comment, he described the adrenaline rush that he got from swiping his credit card. In another, he mocked what he viewed as the cheap food tastes of those on his university campus, saying, quote, how can you willingly eat ramen? It didn't take long for the public to learn that Alan's materialism wasn't simply obnoxious. It had actually gotten him into legal trouble. 
on the day after the triple murder of his family was announced. It was also reported that Allen was being held in police custody for a prior, unrelated offense. That offense was nearly $5,000 in spending on a credit card that he had fraudulently obtained in his grandmother's name the previous summer. Allen had pleaded guilty to fraud charges in January of 2014, but because of his age and lack of criminal record, had been allowed to take part in a delayed sentencing program for young offenders. However, he had recently violated the terms of the program by traveling out of state and consuming alcohol. Just a day later, on October 15th, the public learned why police had been so keen to keep Allen in custody for the violation. They believed that he was behind the triple murder of his family and charged him with three counts of first-degree murder. It turned out that the credit card fraud was not a one-off incident for Alan Ruby. He and his parents had fought frequently about money for years, but nothing could convince him to stop his reckless spending. Leading up to the murders, his parents had finally cut him off financially, causing him to become enraged. Prosecutors alleged that he killed his parents for his inheritance money and had also taken out his sister so that he would be the sole heir. As a side note, at the time of Allen's arrest, police had previously been investigating him in another fraud case for allegedly writing more than $17,000 in bogus checks after stealing them from a friend of his grandmother's. Allen also claimed that he was $3,000 in debt to a loan company in Norman, and at some point reportedly said that part of the reason for the crime was that he feared what would happen to him if he didn't pay it back. Though Allen initially denied committing the murders during his questioning, he eventually confessed, admitting to what he had done and saying that he had been motivated by money. He then shared chilling details about how the crime had unfolded. Late on the night of October 8th, Allen had traveled in his Jeep Wrangler from his school campus to the family home, where he had stolen a 9mm handgun from his father's pickup truck. After that, he went back to school, before heading to Duncan again on the afternoon of October 9th to carry out the crime. At approximately 5 p.m., he quietly slipped through the back door of the house, armed with the stolen handgun. He snuck up on his mother in the kitchen and shot her in the head, firing again after she had fallen to the floor and still showed signs of life. He waited until his sister Catherine came in from washing her car before attacking her as well, shooting her fatally in the neck. After that, Alan had waited over an hour for his father to come home, again surprising him in the kitchen. Like with his mother, Alan shot John once in the head before finishing him off with another round. Disturbingly, Alan told police that his surprised father had yelled ouch after the first gunshot before crumpling to the floor. Equally as chilling as the crime itself was what Alan claimed he had done next. He said that he had disposed of the weapon in home security footage in a nearby lake before heading to Dallas for the weekend with friends. He had gone there to attend the annual football game between his university and another there, and had spent the weekend partying and staying at the Ritz-Carlton. He had posted to his social media throughout that time, as if nothing had happened. Allen's friends would later say that he gave no indication that anything was wrong, and was not acting weird at all during the weekend. His friend Andrew Borman told police, quote, Every time I saw him, he was laughing and having a good time. During their interrogation of Allen, investigators also learned that he had taken significant steps to plan out the murders, and to draw attention away from him as a potential suspect. He left his phone in his dorm room in Norman so that police would not be able to use it to follow his movements, and he parked several blocks away from his family's home before committing the crime so his vehicle would not be seen at the residence. In addition to the security tapes, he stole several valuables from the house to make the scene look like a robbery. He also scheduled at least two posts to his Instagram and Twitter account at the time that he carried out the attacks to give him the appearance of a digital alibi. The first photo was of his residence and was tagged with its name, while the second was a shot of the football field apparently taken from his dorm room with the caption, you could say, we have a good view. As a side note, it appears that the Instagram photos have since been taken down or removed, but a record of Allen's posts, including the ones just mentioned, can still be found on his Twitter account that is active at the time of this recording. Despite Allen's attempts to cover up his crime, authorities were able to find inconsistencies in his story, 
as well as additional evidence that eventually led to his confession. It turned out that on the first trip he made to the family home late on the night of October 8th, he had used a turnpike while traveling from Norman to Duncan. Because it was a tolled route, there was evidence of his vehicle crossing, and records were able to be subpoenaed. On the way back from that same trip, Allen was pulled over for a traffic violation less than a mile away from his family's home. Though he told the officer he did not have his license and insurance and managed to get away with a ticket, the fake name he gave was one that he had used several times before, and police were able to link him to the traffic stop. Investigators later stumbled onto even more damning evidence in the case when they tracked down a storage unit belonging to the Ruby family. Inside were several items of value that had been taken from the crime scene, including the murder weapon and surveillance footage that Allen claimed that he had disposed of after committing the crime. Ahead of Allen's trial for the triple murder, a gag order was put in place by a judge in an attempt to stop even more details about the case from getting out and further prejudicing the potential jury pool. In the meantime, Allen was given a three-year sentence for the credit card fraud case, and in January of 2015, began serving time at the Lexington Assessment and Reception Center in Cleveland County. In June of 2015, prosecutors announced that it would be seeking the death penalty in the triple murder case. To many people's surprise, in a letter sent to the news outlet The Oklahoman a month later, Allen said that he agreed 100% that he should be put to death, and said that his crimes were heinous. In the same letter, he expressed that his biggest concern was that his tearful and emotional responses during preliminary hearings were not being taken seriously, saying in part, quote, I lost my entire family at once. How could they not be real? And, it's just hard to hear that somehow I am faking all of this. Though Allen's trial was set to begin in April of 2016, he and his defense team ultimately agreed to take a deal from prosecutors to plead guilty in exchange for being spared the death penalty. According to reports, the plea agreement came at the behest of John and Joy Ruby's family members who said that they wanted Allen to get life in prison instead of the death penalty so that the case could be definitively put to rest and that they could have closure. Death penalty cases are notorious for dragging on for years, and appeals can be almost endless. Based on what we were able to find, even in cases where the accused agrees with the penalty, a trial still has to be held to determine that there is sufficient evidence of guilt and psychological evaluations have to be done to make sure the defendant is totally competent to be executed. On March 10, 2016, Alan Ruby was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole for the murders of his parents and sister. As part of the conditions of his plea agreement, he is not allowed to appeal his sentence, cannot contact his relatives, and is not allowed to communicate with the media. It was John Ruby's sister Allison who perhaps best summed up the family's sadness and anger over the senseless killings, saying, quote, The killer was part of our family, but no more. He has destroyed that family by his evil and insidious acts. If there were ever a definition of evil, it would be the killer who took our family. I want him never to hurt another soul, or to ever see him again. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.